outside of the American trap circuit in the United States and maybe Canada, the name Dagan Voigtman may not ring a bell with many people, but I have a feeling that'll change really soon. This year, what this 19-year-old did at the world's biggest shotgun event, the Grand American Trap Shooting Tournament in Missouri, he rewrote the record books. Listen closely to Dagan's week at the Grand. He won the most prestigious event, the Grand American Handicap from the back mark of 27 yards with the only 100 straight. He won the high overall award in both the 1,000 and 2,500 target category, the latter by a massive 12 points. And most impressively, he became the first person in the long and prestigious history of the Grand American, an event that's been running since the year 1900, to shoot a perfect 400-400 in the high all around, which is their three national titles. This consists of 200 single targets from 16 yards, 50 pairs of doubles, and of course the 100 straight in the Grand American Handicap. A truly amazing achievement. Now Dagan will be different than our other four competitors in our Champions Week because his career is essentially just beginning. But what a way to start. Let's meet Dagan and try and unlock the secret of his remarkable success. Dagan, thanks very much for your time and for your um, chance to get inside your head. So we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, it's an Dagan, honor. Have you got over your week at the Grand American yet? No, it's still, still, you know, just settling in about, you know, just something starting to get there, but it's just so unreal. I guess the name around the world of Dagan Voigtman, and, and it's, I'm not having a go at you by any means, you're only 19 years of age, but outside of the United States and maybe some of Canada, no one would have known who you were, I guess, before the week of the Grand. But now the week after the Grand, it's everybody saying, oh, where is this kid? Where did he come from? I mean, you, you're captain of the Nebraska State team. I see you've got Ricky Marshall in that team with you. So it's it's no real surprise, I guess, to everyone in Nebraska that that you have been so successful at the Grand. But did it, honestly, did it surprise you how well you went? Yes, it did. I, I mean, leading into it, I was shooting good and all that, but it just, everything just clicked and did better than I thought I would. Well, you didn't just win the one event. You won the Grand American Handicap. You won the high overall for the thousand targets and um you know and you got a, a a win along the way in the Kriegoff championship uh, the handicap event as well um everyone that i have spoken to says you you're better off 27 yards than you are off 16 yards um is that a fair way to describe your shooting why are you so good from the fence for me it's more comes down to focus i don't know what it is but when i walk up to the 27 it seems like i focus more or I just, something about it that I just focus harder. I would also say, sorry, I've never really thought about this. So it's kind of, I just do it. That's why I'm kind of. How many hundred straights have you shot from 27 yards now? Six. Six. At 19 yeah. years of age, you know, of anyone else in the United States that could say they've done that six times? Not that I know of. It's interesting because um, we saw that in the high all around, six of the 10 best finishers were all juniors. You know, is mm -hmm. there a move in the ranks? Are you guys all pushing each other, you know, behind the scenes to get, you know, such a competitive ranks in the juniors? I think that's part of, you know, you always just want to do better than your competition. And they, you know, they're doing better and that pushes you to do better. And you doing better is pushing them. And I think it kind of just pushes everyone to just, so do you guys all shoot together? I mean, are there opportunities where you guys are competing against each other regularly or is it just the one annual event where you get the chance to compete against one another? I see a lot of them at, at the state shoots I go to. You know, there's always a good turnout of them. I don't necessarily shoot with them. I usually have a squad I shoot with. One of them is junior gold that I shoot with, but I usually shoot with him and some other people from Minnesota. It would be Ben Dietz. I don't know if you probably don't know him, but it would be Ben Dietz and uh, Jim Makoviak. Um, then Nick Kubosh, and then we usually have a random fifth that we usually don't have. And, you know, just every shoot will be different, but that's the group we try to shoot with. Well, I guess the bad news for a lot of those kids is that you've got another three years in the junior category. This isn't like you're leaving anytime soon. Do you <laughs> go to any of these tournaments just wanting to win the juniors? Because that's going to change now. Everyone's going to want to beat Dagan Voigtman, all the men. 
Um, does winning a junior prize mean anything to you anymore? It it does because it's you know still shows that I shot good, but you know I always go there with the mind I want to shoot the best I can and do the best I can. So I I really you know try to strive for more than just the junior and junior gold trophies. So speaking of striving for more, do you have any long term goals in this? sport keep growing as a shooter and raising my averages really I just you know keep improving every every year and and do you want to do that mostly in ATA or are you looking ever to possibly transition across to Olympic level never really thought about it as of now I would say just in the ATA do you get asked that at all I mean for the, the folks back home that you go back and you've won three championship rings do people then say to you um are you going to next year's Olympic Games? People that don't understand shooting, do they understand there is a difference between the ATA and the Olympic sports? Yes, I would say there's a good understanding, you know, back here that it's completely different, you know. You could be a good ATA shooter and not be able to shoot Olympics, you know, trap. Okay, so in terms of training and your level of commitment um, to be able to get to this level in ATA, do you shoot a lot of practice, competition? What's your sort of training schedule look like? During the summer, that's when I usually do most of my competition. I guess that's when I do all of it mostly because with school, it's kind of hard to compete. Maybe, you know, right after the grand, I might take a month or two off, you know, just kind of a little rest. And then after that, I'll start getting back into it and I'll try to shoot at least three times a week, maybe a little bit more. And at each practice, I, you know, I like to shoot at least 50 of all three events. But like the first month of me getting back into it, it might be, you know, more than 50 of it. But once I feel like I got back into the routine of it, I'll just shoot 50 of each because I, I kind of more believe in quality over quantity. I would, you know, want to try the hardest I can on those 50 and try to get all of those instead of shooting, you know, 200 targets and not trying as hard. Well, you, you broke a record at the Grand to be the first ever person to break 400 out of 400 in the high all around. And, and the Grand's been going since 1900. Can I take you back to that afternoon, your last five targets of the Grand American Handicap? You've ran 200 straight in the singles. You've ran 100 straight in the doubles. You've ran the first three layouts clean in the Grand American Handicap. Then you shoot the first four stands clean of your last round. You walk on to the last stand. You've got five targets to go, not only to establish a record of 400-400, but a big chance also to win the United States' biggest trap shooting event in the Grand American Handicap. Be honest, were you nervous or did it just happen? Yes, I was <laughs> nervous. It's right towards the end, yeah. So what were you thinking? Those last five shots were just completely different, you know. It just wasn't, don't know how to describe it. It was just different, just nervous and didn't want to mess up because I'm this close and just... Does does Dagan Boitman have a little man in his head talking to him, or do you put that little man in your head asleep? Do you have a song that you listen to? What, what do you do to distract yourself with that amount of pressure? I've usually been pretty good about not, you know, thinking bad thoughts or thinking on the line, so I don't listen to music, but at that time with those last five shots, I definitely had that evil man come in and start saying stuff. It, because uh, you'd hate yourself for the rest of your life if you had have missed one of those last five on the last stand. Yeah, yeah. We may not even be talking to you now, Dagan, if you did that. Yeah. <laughs> you hit all five. And um, you shot with the same squad all week. They would have been just as nervous as what you would have been, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, they're probably just as nervous or maybe even more. I know Jim, the guy who was talking about the older guy, he said he was, you know, shaking and more nervous for me hitting them than him, you know. All right. We, we have a lot of technical people that watch our videos, so they're going to want to know what you're doing differently than them. Can you tell us about your gun setup? What do you use and what do you do differently from 16 yards to 27 yards? I shoot a K80 trap special. Uh 34 on single and a 30 inch double barrel. I would say I have it set up about 80, 20, 90, 10 ish, probably right around in there. And I shoot the same on 16s as in handicap. So you don't, hold but, the you don't lift the cone. No, up. I don't. No, for the point of impact, I just keep the same. But on 16s, I would hold, you know, maybe about a foot over the trap house. But then when I get to the 27, I like to hold the bead just right on the front edge of the trap house. just to give me that edge and seeing the target just a little bit quicker. So are you a two-eyed shooter? Do you use both eyes? 
I'm a two eye tutor. Yes. Okay. And what ammunition do you use? Uh, I use Winchester double A's 1145 ounce and an eighth of on 16s and then the super handicap 1250s on the handicap. And shot size? Eights on 16s and then seven and a half in the handicap. And choke? Chokes on 16s, I shoot the improved modified and then full in the handicap. And then in doubles, I shoot modified for the first shot and then improved mod for the second shot. Um, you, you shot the 100 in the doubles. I, I didn't see where you finished in the actual shoot off part of that. Uh, how far did you go? And again, in the singles, I didn't see how far you went. Where did you finish in those two events? Well, the singles is a little rough. I went out there and missed the first two outs, so didn't do too good in that one. <laughs> but then the doubles, I ran the first 20, and then you had to shoot two rounds no matter what happens the first one. So I go out there and I missed in the second round of 20. And what people were saying, I don't know if it was true, it was down to three in that round and I missed. Technically, I was the there's three people left, but I ended up getting junior gold runner up because the other junior gold lost. So he got junior champ, junior gold uh, champion. So you won the Grand American Handicap when you ran the 100. Um, did you think it would be the only 100? I thought there'd be another one just because I thought it was a pretty good day. I mean, it got windier towards the afternoon, but I still thought there'd be another one. Do you watch the scoreboard when you compete? Do you actually watch what other people are doing or you just worry about yourself? Uh, not, not until the event's over. I just, you know, worry about myself, worry about putting the best score I can. Because, I mean, scoreboard doesn't really do you justice as long as if you can't put up a good score. So I just try to focus on myself and doing the best I can before worrying about everyone else. So up until now, what would you have said is your best or your biggest highlight in the sport? Probably being the captain of the Nebraska state team last year. I would say that would be the, my biggest highlight before this. Well, you've got a pretty good guy up there in Nebraska to keep you honest in Ricky Marshall. If you can be the captain of the state team and he's in your state, it proves to me that you actually know a little bit more about this sport than what you're letting on. Has Ricky been a, a good person for you to have around to keep you honest? Because uh, he, he, he's very competitive. He's won championship rings himself. Um, I, I bet he'd take a little bit of pride in your success as well. It's good to have him around, you know, just having someone there, you know, also to, he also pushes you to, you know, to try to do better, you know, and all that. So it's just good to have him a good, good person for the sport and, you know, a good shooter. How old were you when you actually started? Oh, I would have been 11. Did you come into the sport just to have fun or did you always come in with some aspirations to shoot at a high level? No, you know, I just, my older brother shot, you know, always watched them at practice and competing at the high school tournaments and stuff, you know, something I really wanted to do and they got me into it. And, you know, at, at first, you know, I just did it in high school, you know, and that's kind of all I did. And then we slowly started getting to the ATA and, you know, shooting the Nebraska state shoot. And then the next summer, you know, we went to some of the other local ones like Kansas and Iowa and Missouri. And, you know, and it just kind of snowballed into what's now. So what's next, Dagan? The next, have you fired a shot since the Grand American? Have you actually been to the range? No, not, not yet. I've been busy with school. You know, I just started, moved in last Wednesday, right as we got back from the, back from the Grand and then started school this week. So I really haven't had time to get to the range. Hoping to, hoping to soon, but... Speaking of school, it's always an interesting transition for a lot of shooters because, you know, up until your age now, you have the support of a family and people behind you fueling your ability to be able to shoot. And often in the sport, we do lose a lot of people at your age because of those types of commitments, things like, you know, college, girlfriends, um, and all those other distractions. At this stage, you know, are you thinking you're going to, attempt to balance it all or you know are you going to focus on your studies for a bit i'm going to attempt to balance it you know i'm going to go to school but i'm also going to practice during the school time and in the summertime you know i'll probably just focus on that I won't take any summer classes and dagan what lauren is trying to say to you is your career is going to go one of two ways here now you listen to me carefully this is the voice of experience you're either going to become the next Leo Harrison or sometime over the next two years, you're going to go to one of these college bars in Nebraska, meet some girl that doesn't like shooting and that'll be the last we ever hear of you. And in 10 years' time, we'll be doing the story, where's Dagan Boyton today? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we certainly hope that isn't. Do you feel any pressure, though, now that you've won all this, that the next time that you do go to a range, are you going to feel that that's sort of hanging over your head, that you've got to hit 400 out of 400 at every stage shoot you attend? Not necessarily. You know, I... I try not to think about stuff like that when I'm shooting, you know, so I always go into the line. I just, you know, let's just do the best I can here. And if it's, if I don't shoot my best, I don't shoot my best, you know, but I'm always going to try. Now the grand American was taken off Sparta and given to Missouri. Um, you'd be leading the charge that they have the grand American at Missouri every year now, I'd imagine, <laughs> and never, ever take it back to Sparta again. But How did you feel about Sparta losing the grand? I, it was kind of a bummer for me. Cause you know, I, I liked it in Sparta, you know, I, Wish we were there. That's where I thought it should have been, you know, but Missouri did a good job, you know, for the time they had to get it, you know, turned around for the grand and getting it, you know, set up and all that. So they, they did a good job, but I'm hoping it's back at Sparta next year, personally. Did you enter all the optional purses along the way? Did you have a father that likes to back you in all of the events? Um, because you yeah. can have a bit of yeah. money in some of them. My dad did back me in the handicap. I usually play the handicap options. That's what I do at least. Can we ask you what the prize was for winning the Grand American Handicap? Because it's a question we get asked all the time and you're the first one we've interviewed that's actually ever won it. <laughs> Can you tell us what you got? What did you take home? I think it was right around twelve to 13000 for the last handicap. So what are you going to do with that money? Don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't spent it on a car already then? No, no. I'll probably invest it in build for the future. Well, you that's the accountant in you speaking to say that. So that's a really good bit of advice. Is that 12 or 13,000 in the options or is that the the prize actually put on by the ATA? That was in the options. I don't know if there was any added money into that. If there was any added money in the event, that would also be in the total. Dagan, who's your coach? Who, who's taught you to get to this stage? Really? I mean, starting out, I had a few coaches, you know, but right now I don't really have one. It's just kind of me and I kind of just push myself and kind of been doing it by myself for the past. I mean, my dad obviously helps me and stuff, but I don't necessarily have a coach, I would say. It's fairly amazing that you've been able to get to this level and you've just done it yourself. Um, and you're not the only competitor that we've spoken to that is self-taught, but maybe that's the answer. Maybe you don't need a coach anymore. Maybe the, all the answers are locked in inside your head. And uh, you're going to get asked a lot, though, to actually coach. People will want to go to you and get advice. Is, is that something that would interest you as another form of income stream? Yes and no, because I don't, I've always had the kind of the thinking of, it's kind of something, there's some things that we can tell you and then there's just some things you got to learn yourself, you know, kind of just like the mental part of it, we can help you with that, but it's just, that's something too that you kind of just have to have and have the drive to keep getting better at, you know, we can tell you how to get better at the mental game, but it really comes down to you if you can do it or can't really. And I guess having the belief in yourself as you obviously yeah. have, I mean, that's, I guess what I was trying to get inside your head about the last five targets in the Grand American, when you have to hit all five of 27 yards, um, it, it, it sounds easy, but it's very, very hard when your heart's pumping at 160 beats per minute. So I guess, you know, there's a lot of talk about pre-shot routine and, you know, it sounds like you do have a lot of emphasis on your mental routine. You know, do you try to stick to the same pre-shot routine every time before you call pull? Yes, I, I, I tried to, you know, I just try to tell myself a positive thought before I mount the gun and then mount the gun and then call pull. And then that's kind of what my routine would be. So while you're waiting for the sh your turn to shoot, um, you yeah, know, yeah. do you try to think about something specific or do you try and distract yourself? How do you go about, you know, the process in the middle of the round before your pre-shot routine? Try to keep some of my focus on the other people's squads targets, you know, to kind of keep my mind, you know, busy also. And then I just try to, you know, like, again, just keep positive thoughts in my mind. You know, I don't want something negative about or negative in my mind coming in or, you know, oh, shoot, I'm 75 straight. You know, that never goes good when you start telling yourself you're certain straight. So I just try to just keep positive, happy thoughts in my mind, really, when I'm shooting. Dagan, when you do have a bad day, are you tempted to fiddle with your stock or change something 
or do you accept that it's you? Because a, a lot of great shooters change their comb of their gun or they go through 15 different walnut trees a year, changing their stock each time. How often do you change your gun? Not very often. This year, I only changed the once, like since I lost a little bit of weight from last year. So when I started shooting again, I adjusted it and changed it to make sure it was shooting right and adjusted. And since I didn't lose weight and kind of just stayed the same weight, you know, I just didn't touch it the whole year. It's a really good point that you've made about, you know, weight variation and obviously has a huge impact on the way that a gun fits. And, you know, coming through the sport, as you said, you started at age 11 and I'm sure your body would have changed many times in that period. You know, was it something that you used a pattern board to be able to help you keep your gun shooting straight or did you just know when it wasn't quite right and you fiddled it accordingly? Starting out, I used a pattern board, you know, just because I didn't have as much experience. So I did that to kind of help, but now I'll, I don't really pattern it as often as I probably should, but you know, I usually like put it on straightaways and I can just tell by where I'm shooting at it and how it's breaking and stuff, if it's shooting how I like, it, and that's how I usually go about it. I'm not sure if you understand how the rest of the world shoots American trap. It's often called down the line in countries like Australia or New Zealand or Great Britain. But here in Australia, our handicap event is off 25 metres for the back markers, which is 27 yards. But here in Australia, we get two shots at the target for one point. Do us all a favour, never come to Australia. <laughs> Because if you can hit 100 on the first barrel, you're never going to miss if we give you two shots at them. But did it surprise you the rest of the world doesn't shoot the American rules? Yeah, I didn't. I guess I didn't really realize that. You know, I thought everyone kind of shot it the same, you know. I, <laughs> different to me. How, how good do you think you'd go if we gave you two shots from 27 yards? <laughs> you know, I don't – I honestly don't know because – I like the 34 inch barrel, you know, I don't know. The swing would be a lot different with the 30 inch just because it's shorter and stuff. So I don't know how I would do actually. Well, I think Krieg Off would give you a set of 34 inch under and over barrels in a heartbeat. Now, I don't think you'll ever have to buy another gun in, gun in your life. To travel around the world and shoot, and we, Leo Harrison came to Australia several times and did very well. He took home a few of our national titles, but is that something that would interest you to actually go and shoot the version of American Trap in, in New Zealand or Australia or Great Britain? Because they all, they'd all welcome you with open arms. Yeah, I think it would be... And cool experience and you know just interesting to see you know what's different about it and just a good experience all in all just traveling the world and doing something you love. Lauren's American but lived here a long time. I don't know if to her does she sound American or Australian to you? Uh, I would say Australian. I would have thought both of you were. Yeah well she's a Californian. She grew up there for 20 years so uh, don't hold that against her though. I know you Nebraska. Yeah that big on I that. used to shoot in the US team and I met Russell and um, ended up shooting for Australia, so don't hold that against me, all right? Do you have many sponsors for support at this level? Going into the Grand, I didn't, but right now, kind of talking to people. The good old boys on trapshooters.com, they speak very, very highly of you, so you obviously have a bit of a following over there already, and that was probably some of those guys that I was listening to the comments about how you handled yourself at the Grand that made me want to do this interview. So I would think um, sponsors eventually won't be a problem for you, but because you don't get quite the profile in ATA as maybe some of the Olympic shooters would get, but to get sponsors, you, you need to have exposure, and, and it, I can understand it's hard for you guys. Yeah, I'd say that's a big part of it. Don't really know how much I could talk about it because, you know, I haven't really experienced this with sponsorships and stuff, so I don't have too much to say about it. But I'd say, you know, it's hard, you know, when you aren't recognized, I guess. Yeah, uh, Russell often touches on that. He said, you know, after he won the Olympic gold medal was when he got all the sponsorship and support thrown at him, and it was the time before that that he really needed – you know, the majority of the support. And I'm sure a lot of athletes feel the same, you know, that when before, it's the before period where you really need it. Um, you have just gone into college, is that correct? Yes, this is my first week, full week. So where did, where are you going and do they have a shooting program? Uh, they have a club. So you practice and everything's kind of on your own and then you can go to nationals with them. But it's, you know, on your own, you have to pay for everything. and 
I think they just take you down there basically. I tossed around, you know, going to college, you know, to shoot or going for an education. I kind of came down to me, you know, I kind of picked education over college shooting just for the fact that if I, you know, focus harder on college during the school time, you know, I can have a better job, better chance of getting a better job and then be able to shoot more when I have the job. You've got an elder brother, at least I know, that shoots. How many other siblings have you got? I have three three older brothers. Two of them shoot, and one really didn't shoot too much. Did the other two brothers that shoot were they at the grand? No, they were not this year. Um, My oldest brother trying to get back into it, but he had some summer classes where he couldn't make it. How did your brothers take your success? Because at uh, around the table now at Thanksgiving, they won't be able to really say too much anymore when you see them. <laughs> How were they with your success? Oh, they were just full of joy and happy, and you know just. So supportive. And have you got a girlfriend or a partner? Have you got... Uh, no. Well, if that... you want to stay shooting, you might want to keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or find a shooting girlfriend. And yeah, yeah. when is the next major competition for you? When's the next state shoot? I think you've already had your Nebraska state shoot this year. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. when's the next one for you? Because you do go to some of the other state shoots, I see. I guess I haven't really looked at my breaks for college but if I have a break that lines up with one of the Arizona's or Florida shoots I might try to make it to one of those but if that can't happen it'll probably be you know middle of May end of May when kind of all the state shoots start you know popping up again. So you've got quite a big break um tell me has the COVID crisis um affected your shooting at all in your preparation for the grand because here at this very moment where we live here in Melbourne we're all locked down still all every Every shooting range in our city is closed. So we're not doing any of that. But you guys came out of the COVID crisis a little bit differently. But did it affect your lead up to the grand? Kind of, but not really. I mean, the club that we shoot at was still open. You know, you can come and set it up yourself and still shoot, you know. So you still did. I could still do that. But, I mean, kind of going into the season, you know, getting ready for the first few state shoots and stuff, it's like, are we going to have them? Are we not going to have them? How much practicing do I need to do? You know, I wish I would have practiced more at the beginning of the summer, but I just didn't know, you know, are we going to have them? And do I practice more? Or do I practice how much I am now? So I just, I would say in the long run, not really, but at the beginning of the summer, I would say it hurt a little bit. Well, I'll give you the tip, Dagan. You hit 400 out of 400. You practice the right amount. Whatever you did this year, you need to copy it next year when you go to the Grand. <laughs> hey, Dagan, we really appreciate your time. Um, it's been interesting to meet someone that's achieved so much at such a young age. And as I said, we, we've put this series of five shooters together on people that we believe have shaped our sport and people that we believe in the future may dictate the direction it goes. And I don't want to put the pressure on you that you're the next Leo Harrison or Dan Benias or Ray Stafford, but to get three of those championship rings at one grand American certainly puts you on the right path. We look forward to seeing how your career evolves from this point. Well, thank you. And it was a pleasure. And I'm glad you guys had me. It was such an honor. Thanks, David. We thank wish you. you all the best. Thank you.